Today's guest grew up in a home that was absent of any faith in God, which left him groping in spiritual darkness and searching for the truth. Well, God had a great plan for him, and through a divine intervention, he came to know the Lord. Roger Helland is here to share his story of how God has brought him from pagan to pastor to <laughs> prayer and a seeker of God's presence. You'll want to hear more, so stay with us for Lifeline Today. Welcome to Lifeline Today. We're glad you're part of the program. Yes. It's going to be an exciting program. You're going to hear a great testimony. But let me encourage you to call the prayer lines early in the program. We find Joan, they're they filling lock up. up. <laughs> and you might be getting voicemail. By the way, if you get voicemail, be assured they call you back. Yeah. But call early and that make the workload just a little better for our phone operators and we have our own phone operators right here in our studios. Yeah. It's not somewhere else in North America, it's right here. <laughs> well, welcome to the program, Roger Helen. Welcome, good we, to have you, you here. Wow. Let me introduce you. Uh, you are presently <laughs> serving as a prayer ambassador for the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. That's significant in itself, isn't it? Author of seven books, over 35 years experience as a pastor and denominational leader. You survived 35 years as a pastor? <laughs> I thrived. Yeah, okay, I then, just survived, I then, thrived. Then you qualify to be on television, <laughs> right? And let me tell you, there's much more we could have listed here. So, oh, that's yeah. good yeah. news. Welcome, Thank you. Welcome Thank you. to Lifeline today. It's a pleasure welcome to be to here. Lifeline. You're located today in, in Airdrie, yes, just, just, out, just north of Calgary. Just north of Calgary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you've been in Kelowna, you've been in many other parts of the North America, actually, haven't you? Grew up in Southern California, lived in Kelowna for 22 years in British Columbia. You said you graduated in 69, same as me. 69? Summer of 69. Summer of 69, <laughs> Brian Adams <laughs> sings about it, so. Yeah. Oh Best my year goodness. ever. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, you know, Roger, when uh, we wanted to talk to you about your testimony, because, right. the, you know, the way that God captured you and got hold of your life is quite incredible. And, uh, you say in your book that a lot of people ask you about your background right. because your life has literally touched and has been shaped by so many flavors of Christianity over the years. And uh, so let's just start where we, you know, way back in 1969. Right. Well, yeah. like I've said to many different people, what is your background? And I say my background, I can summarize it in one word, it's pagan. Oh, yeah. And uh, if people don't know what the word pagan means, you can look it up, but it basically means you're not a really nice person. So I grew <laughs> up in Southern California living a lifestyle that was basically devoid of God completely. Mm. So I grew up in a non-Christian family. Um, my parents basically really didn't have any Christian faith to speak of, or we never went to church, never read the Bible, never prayed. In fact, Jesus Christ was a, a swear word in our family. I think a lot of people can understand that. And, uh, and yet I was involved in a lot of the lifestyle that a pagan would be involved in. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you can kind of fill in the darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, Southern California, so <clears throat> again, it was a tumultuous time of the, uh, uh, you know, Southern California world, California world, American world uh, of uh, civil rights and a lot of, you know, riots and Vietnam War was, you know, full force and uh, a lot of tension and the hippie movement, basically, you mm -hmm. know, long hair, hippie, drugs, the whole sort of lifestyle. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what I grew up in. Right. Well, they just had a movie. The Bone Jesus Lonnie Revolution, Shen. right. So and it, all about that culture, right? So some of those beaches where those people were baptized are beaches that I would frequent uh, growing up, just east of Los Angeles or west east of Los Angeles. And uh, by the way, Dodger fan, just just saying uh, yeah. <laughs> for those that are perhaps in California or, or uh, like the Dodgers. But uh, yeah. so the Jesus Revolution movie sort of captures that moment. Yeah. where those of us that were embracing 
sort of the hippie lifestyle and, and the culture of the day, God really turned that around and, yeah. and was able to reach the hunger of those young people. I was saved on the fringes of the Jesus movement. Right. I wasn't in it, but I was, I was actually in the U.S. Army at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, on my way to Vietnam, and so it was on the fringes of the, of the Jesus Revolution, but uh, familiar with the California yeah. scene that mm -hmm. that depicts in that movie. Yeah. yeah. So take us through your journey, because right. you know, uh, how did you go from living that life to actually accepting the Lord as your right. Savior? This is going to sound probably unusual, but again, it underscores the sovereignty and power of the Spirit of God. Yeah. So I was actually stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, I had been transferred there from Fort Ord in the U.S. Army, and I came home on Christmas leave for a couple of weeks. And uh, a friend of mine, <clears throat> during the time I was in boot camp, actually became a Christian. So he became a Jesus freak. That's what they called him back then. <laughs> well, they did. He, yeah, he was a Jesus freak. And I remember yeah. Josh McDowell said, you know, Jesus doesn't make freaks out of people. He makes people out of freaks, right? right. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. But they were called Jesus freaks. So, but him and I and all our friends, we used to deal drugs and kind of the whole lifestyle together. But he, he, he came to faith. So I came home on Christmas leave thinking I'm going to do lifestyle, you know, with him. And so I took LSD, which was pretty common back then. And it was a Friday night, I'll never forget it. I was peaking on LSD mm. around 10 o'clock at night. And we went up to Glendora Mountain Road at the top of the road where we overlooked the city where we grew up, where we'd all go up there to do our thing as high school students. And he started sharing the gospel with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. what is this? I'd never heard the gospel. I knew about Jesus, sort of, in the Bible and the church, but wow. really it was a foreign topic. The Holy Spirit penetrated my darkness. Wow. And pulled my heart to this really step of faith. And I prayed my first prayer. I says, okay, Jesus. This was literally the first prayer I'd ever wow. prayed. Okay, Jesus, if you are real, I want to believe. Yeah. That was it. Hmm. Peaking on acid, hallucinating, Spirit comes through, felt this pull and tug on my heart, which I look back now, I know it was a convicting presence of the yeah. Spirit, calling me to faith. A couple weeks later, I went back to Fort Ord, or uh, Fort Lewis, and uh, it was a Saturday morning, bright, cold, blue Saturday morning. And I was in the barracks all by myself, and I felt this inrush of light and, and joy and surprised by it was the presence of God. Wow. wow. That's what it was a visitation of the Lord. Yeah. And I knew in that moment I was I came to faith. Yeah. I, I Christ had wow. entered my heart and my yeah. life. And from that point on it was a process of you know sanctification. Sanctification really, it is in purging <laughs> my old lifestyle into yeah. walking uh, following Jesus for the next you know, I just want to say that the scriptures talk about being born again. Yes. And, you know, in the yeah. Gospel of John, except a man be born yes. again, he will not enter the kingdom. But really, the word means born from above. Yeah, it? right. The original right. translation, born from above. Born from above. And that's a great illustration of what happened. That your, your that's exactly what happened. example, great illustration of being born from above. The Holy Spirit comes in. And yeah. something changes. So wow. I experienced a personal Pentecost in that in that encounter. Yeah. Filling of the Spirit, the empowerment of the Spirit, activation of my faith. And from that point on, it was decisive encounters with God that brought me into a pathway of where I am today. So I went from pagan and moved to pastor. And that, that part of the journey is all part of the unpacking of God's sovereignty. I want to say one thing about God's seeking me. I wasn't seeking God. Mm. I wasn't seeking God. I was seeking everything else, trying to fill the void that young people try to do, mm -hmm. and lots of people without the Lord try to fill the void with other things that don't work. He sought me out and visited me on that Friday night at 10 o'clock yeah. and encountered me with the gospel through my friend who became a it's Jesus awesome. freak. It's amazing. Yeah. It is, isn't it? it? Is so amazing. I'm transformed. Yeah. <laughs> I cut so my hair. <laughs> Yeah. I did get baptized in, in Laguna Beach, uh, not Laguna, but uh, Newport Beach in a lagoon there. I, I still had short length hair and all suntan, plopped in the waters of baptism a couple years later. And uh, so I can relate to the Jesus Revolution of people getting baptized in the Pacific yes. in the Ocean. Of course. Yeah. 
it's it's here so it yeah. was great yeah how did you become a pastor there must have been a, right. a season there where you did you take bible college or yes yeah okay so uh, so i worked uh, part-time mm -hmm. as a custodian while i was going to a junior college in california i thought i was going into forestry mm. i like trees i like the outdoors i thought yes. forestry is maybe the way to go but uh, the lord had other plans so there was another encounter with the lord where again, I look back on, I see these encounters of presence, mm -hmm. right? And I happened to be working part-time at a, a junior high school as a custodian. Yeah. It was about 7.30 at night. I was vacuuming the library, I was all by myself. And I'm vacuuming, I'm just thinking, I went, oh. And I, I stood there and I, and I stopped, and I turned the vacuum on, I just stood there in the middle of the library and I'm going, uh, you know what it feels like sometimes when you think somebody's there looking at yeah. you? It was the Lord. Wow. Hmm. It was the Lord. That library was filled with his presence, and yeah. I could hardly move. Wow. And there was this sort of quickening. It's hard to put it into words. It, yeah. it was an encounter mm -hmm. that was an invitation wow. to where I now look back, it was, a, it was an invitation to walk out my faith in terms of professional ministry, pastoral mm -hmm. work, right? I didn't have all the details about that, but that was sort of the inner nudge. Mm -hmm. And uh, long story short, I was at the same school a couple weeks later. I was at a dumpster. It was full to the top uh, with trash and stuff. And on the very top, there was this shiny magazine. And I pulled the magazine off the top and looked at it, and it said Campus Life magazine. I'm going, like, Campus Life, it's Campus Life. Those aren't the kind of magazines that I read back then. Yeah. <laughs> but I read this Campus Life magazine, and I took it into the faculty office, and I felt these inrushes of the oh, presence of goodness. God. And I'm looking at it, and it, had a, it happened to be a quarterly issue, I found out later, that advertises Bible colleges and universities, Christian universities. Wow. A lot of them were in Canada, eh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> Good, eh? <laughs> and I applied to about 10 of them. And I said, I felt the Lord say to me, the first one that you apply to, they're going to say yes, and that's the place you're going to go. And it happened to be in Vancouver, Vancouver Bible College. Yeah. And I ended up going due north and went three years to Bible College there. Went to Dallas Seminary after that for four years, and that was sort of my introduction to the world towards pastoral work. Right. Mm. Out of Southern California, into Canada, into a Bible college, yeah. down to Dallas to, to the seminary, and then back to Canada where I got a uh, position uh, uh, teaching at a Bible college in Kelowna, British yeah. Columbia. Right. And then from there, pastoral work, and I can yeah. tell you. Yeah. I want you to tell the story because there was an incident. There was a, a prayer meeting, yes. uh, which was actually a Christmas fellowship gathering yes. in Kelowna yeah. at the church that you were Correct. on staff with her pastoring yeah. at that time. Uh, and you had a real nudge that, uh, you know, God wanted you to all pray before you went home. Right. Just tell us about that, because I think it was a pivotal point in your life as well. It was pivotal. Again, it was one of those encounters of presence. Yes. So I think it was in 1987, uh, December, first week in December. I forget, I don't know if it's the 7th or 8th. I can't remember the exact date, but it was in 87. I was actually an elder at, do you want to know the, the church? Sure. So, so it was New Life Vineyard Church in yeah. Kelowna. And we were gathering together uh, for a Christmas dinner at one of the other elder couples' home. Yeah. Right? There was eight couples, pastoral staff, elders, uh, couples, or eight couples together. And, you know, we had dinner and we had fellowship and exchange gifts and different things. Then around 10 o'clock, we're all getting ready to kind of leave. And I felt this unusual nudge that mm. we needed to spend some time in prayer. Well, that doesn't fit. <laughs> We're getting ready to leave. This is a Christmas dinner. We're all getting yeah. ready to go for the yeah. weekend. Yeah. And I just thought, no, we, we need to stay back. And so I sort of persisted yeah. in that nudge that was growing. And so they went, OK, OK. So we went downstairs into the basement, sat around on couches, and uh, we, we all kind of didn't know what we were praying mm -hmm. and began to pray. 
And in about 10 minutes, the Holy Spirit went, boom. Wow. We're talking full-scale visitation of the Lord. Amazing. The outpouring of His Spirit was so dramatic. Amazing. There were manifestations, and there was prophetic, and there was repentance, and there was just a stirring mm. of revival, renewal, uh, which you read about yeah. In, yeah. In, in encounters with God. Five hours later, wow. we staggered out about 2.30 in the, in the morning. We didn't know what happened. We're yeah. Baptists and brethren, yes. you know? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're young couples that experience a, a holy visitation yes. of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it catapulted our church into a pathway of renewal that mm. every time we get together to pray, the same thing would happen. It started spilling out and touching other people in our congregation yeah. before Toronto. That's yeah. exactly what happened. Yeah. Before the Toronto blessing, it yeah. happened at New Life in your yeah. in Kelowna. In Kelowna in that elders room yeah. uh, home and spilled out into our church and into the community. It started touching hundreds of people. It became sort of more and more uh, public and we couldn't control it. It's but amazing. it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I mean, <laughs> it had numerous challenges of pastoring and stewarding it when you don't have a framework right. for those kinds of encounters. Mm -hmm. You're flying by the seat of your pants You're flying in some by the seat of your pants. You're having supernatural encounters. You're having demonic expulsions. You're having healings. You're having people shake and falling and laughter. And it goes on. Not that the manifestation it is yeah. the goal. Those are some of the effects of that encounter with the Holy Spirit in this smaller town, which the word gets out. And now we're kind of the... <laughs> But, you know, there are records of those kinds there of are. experiences, yeah. not going back just 50 years or 100 years, yeah. hundreds of years yes. Yes. that there were these uh, usually uh, timed with the launch of a movement, yeah. you know, yeah. like the Wesley movement, the yes. Methodist movement, yeah. these things, and they launch into something. So this is very authentic. But uh, very, very authentic. different. Most people don't have that experience. Yeah. See, we were all theologically sophisticated. Yeah. We, we weren't given to sort of excess and error. Yeah. Bible, college, seminary, theological, yeah. you know, yeah. biblical people. But what I see uh, in the book that I wrote about this narrative, uh, Pursuing God's Presence, is that I learned to exegete and expound scripture from Dallas Seminary. Bible, mm. Bible, Bible. Yeah. Never yeah. dispensationalist. Which is good. It Very is. fundamental. But I looked from the vineyard, learned experience of spirit. Put yeah. those two together, scripture Put and spirit together, yeah. became the, awesome. the pathway that we awesome. endeavored to walk in. I'm the same way, you know, I'm Dutch Reformed background. Okay. Grew up Dutch Reformed. And they were all about the Bible, the Bible, the right. Bible, you know. And, I, <laughs> and, and then we came into the fullness of the spirit. But I just want to say, when you have that in your yeah. foundation, yes. You, it only becomes richer and deeper yes. and more important, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, to be uh, able to be a Bible expositor and base right. everything on the right. scripture. Right. Powerful. So I, I ended up becoming a pastor in that church Wonderful. after that elders meeting about yeah. a year or so later, full time preaching pastor, teaching pastor, working with networks and small groups. The church had grown from about a core group of 30 to about 1,200 in wow. about five years. Yes. Wow. It, it just was bursting at the seams. Yeah. And it's renewal the was really part and parcel of who we were. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just got to say, though, Roger, wh this is our experience, too. Once you've experienced yes. the presence of God yes. in your life like that, yeah. I would say, for us anyway, nothing else measures up, and you're always seeking for that again say god do it yes, again yes. have you have you felt like that you and gail your wife gail always always those encounters are you can't duplicate them you can't replicate them they must they're part of a, an unending river of life mm -hmm. in, in when when jesus says you know uh that the spirit is like living water in your heart, right? Mm -hmm. The river is a living water. Yes. It, it's an unending supply and, and, and energy. And so seeking mm -hmm. the presence of God has now for decades become really 
the focal point of mm. life and leadership. You know, we hear from so many people that we're on the edge, we're on the cusp right. of something that God is going to do again. Right. And uh, so have you seen that or have you experienced that? Have you seen pockets of this kind of experience, the presence of God that would indicate to you that God is setting us up for something again? Yeah, I mean, uh, been across the country, so just recently I returned from a tour with, there's five ministry groups uh, of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, National House of Prayer, Peace and Reconciliation Network, and Vineyard Canada. We, we collaborated together to do some summits, prayer and worship summits mm -hmm. in Ottawa, Calgary, Kelowna, and in Regina. And mm -hmm. the prevailing tone there was a seeking for the presence of God. Yeah and developing cultures of prayer, and there's pockets of renewal and expectation for the move of God across denominations and traditions. Yeah. All over the country. Wow. Yeah. Really, all over the world. Yeah. It's just bubbling up. So yeah. something's brewing. Something is brewing. I believe there's going to be a convergence of all the movements that we've known historically here in the last few centuries, really, mm -hmm. and there will be a convergence at this, this point in time where we consider the end of the age. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what? The ha harvest is going to come in. When I was uh, 19, I experienced one of those experiences where the Lord walked into a room. I was on the floor, and my body turned to liquid as far as I could tell. <laughs> and I was, uh, be, make it short, but I was told, the Lord told me I'd be a part of the greatest harvest the earth will ever witness. Really? And I believe we're in that day. And we're in that day hour. It's in the coming seven years, 10 years, or whatever it might be. <laughs> we're talking to Roger Helen. We're going to come right back at, right after this. Help change the spiritual climate of Canada by becoming a monthly partner with Lifeline Today with Dick and Joan. All donors will receive this year's Lifeline Today fridge magnet, a reminder that you stand together with Dick and Joan for Canada. Pledge your support for $25 a month and receive Joan's book, Five Hours in Heaven. In this book, she recounts her visitation to heaven where she experienced a transforming atmosphere of God's love. A must read for those who have loved ones in heaven. Partner at $50 a month and also receive this authentic anointing oil from Israel along with prayer cloths, powerful spiritual aids when releasing your faith for healing and miracles. Lifeline Today has also commissioned this beautiful flag as a testament to our faith in God for the nation of Canada. Suitable as a home or garden flag, it can also be used as a wall hanging or prayer shawl as you pray for Canada. It's our thank you gift to you for your faith-filled partnership of $100 a month. Your tax-deductible donation will empower this ministry to release the prophetic voice of God across our nation. Call today and say yes to becoming a partner with Dick and Joan. As God's children, we have special access to His help. When we ask for God's help, we're actually plugging into God's wisdom. When we seek Him and ask Him for whatever we need, we can operate with the mind of Christ. Anytime we need God's help for anything in our lives, the Holy Spirit is available to assist us. We need God's wisdom to avoid mistakes and to make the right decisions. Proverbs 3 verses 13 to 18 says, Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. She will guide you down delightful paths. All her ways are satisfying. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. If you need wisdom and would like us to pray with you, or if you have any other needs you'd like prayer for, give us a call here at the Lifeline Today Prayer Center. Our number is 403-942-0123 or email us at prayercenter at dickandjoan.com. Talking to Roger Helland, and what a great uh, story. I can relate to points of your story. That, <laughs> yes, very and, much And, you so. know, so many in our generation do share this because I think there's a mark of God on our generation. But uh, we talked to you about pagan to prayer. How about now uh, where now we're going from, no, pagan to pastor, now prayer to presence. Let's talk right. about that part. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> As a pastor, I realized that there's a lot of emphasis on preaching, 
there's a lot of emphasis on services and programs and ways, you know, care and small groups and connecting people and trying to bring transformation. But I realized, and in the movements that we were in, is that prayer was really the fuel that mm -hmm. tapped into the supernatural yeah, resources of God. Sure. Right. right? Believe in preaching, believe in all kinds of great programs and worship and such. And yet prayer, I think biblically and, and historically, is really the fuel for spiritual and supernatural work. And so as I began to grow as a pastor, I became more and more committed and devoted to prayer. So Acts 6-4 really became a premier verse. I'll devote myself to prayer and to the ministry of the Word, but notice prayer is first, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would have uh, lots of different prayer gatherings and try and teach our people prayer and intercession and such. And then over time, you know, as a pastor, I was, you know, moved on into Alberta mm -hmm. uh, to take up a position as a district superintendent, district minister of the, actually the Baptist General Conference of Alberta. So I've actually pastored in the Vineyard, in the Mennonite Brethren, in the Christian Missionary Alliance, and then I became a Baptist overseer for 29 <laughs> churches in Alberta. So I've sort of run a, a lot of different traditions and streams, mm -hmm. and I found that one of the common elements is that there was a lack of prayer in denominations, in wow. churches, in leaders' lives, wow. and in churches and church services, and I've had a growing discontent and felt that, you know, biblically, we, we've got to tap into prayer as the primary sort of resource that God has given to connect with him. And as we began to explore uh, more and more teaching and practice and challenging our pastors to really devote themselves to prayer and bring prayer more into their church environments, and different ones did, they started noticing results. Mm. They would see answers to prayer. They'd see a difference in their preaching. Yeah. They'd bring more prayer in the environment of their local churches. And it began to sort of take root. And so that's where the life of prayer became for me sort of this non-negotiable practice where yeah. daily I'm up early in the morning praying, reading scripture, and looking at the life of Jesus, how he de dedicated himself to prayer. And how the early church was a praying church. Jack Deere says this, that one of the primary diff differences between the ancient church, early church, and the modern church is that the early church was a praying church. The modern church is a talking church. Church, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I read that in your book, and I think that's actually really a good... You know, we're out of time. Oh, can it you believe it? It went by so quickly. And, uh, but we're going to do another program with you, and we're going to mine this out a little more, but you're absolutely correct. Thank you for being a part of the program yeah. today. And uh, if you want to call the Prayer Center, we're there. We'll listen to you. And, yes, stay tuned for the part two that will come at some point with yeah. Roger Helen. Thank you for again for being a part of the program. Remember this, Canada will be saved. This program is supported by viewers like you, and we thank you for partnering with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your prayer requests, praise reports, and comments about the program. To watch past episodes, learn about the ministry, or contact us, visit our website at dickandjoan.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Lifeline Today with Dick and Joan and on our YouTube channel, Dick and Joan TV.